Divinity Original Sin 2 is the best game ever made. In this video, we'll discuss why Divinity Original Sin 2 is actually the best game of all time, and why you should play it based on my completely unbiased and objective opinion that I am sure 100% of viewers will agree with and will generate commentary, only telling me how perfectly correct I am. In this video, we'll talk about how Divinity Original Sin 2 changed the dialogue about turn-based RPGs and how it brought them back into mainstream gaming, picking up where its predecessor left off. Why is it that DOS 2 accomplished this and not the first title? That's something we'll also explore in this video. This is the third in a series of videos exploring how many games have gotten impressively huge and committed fan bases, and what's great about each of them. If you haven't noticed yet, the title is not a serious one. Divinity Original Sin 1 first launched in June 2014, having successfully funded a Kickstarter campaign to the tune of nearly $1 million the previous year. And even though it followed on the heels of Pillars of Eternity's Kickstarter that raised four times as much money and was the highest funded game of all time at the time, it actually launched almost a year before Pillars of Eternity. And one can even make the argument that the Kickstarter success of DOS 1 was in part thanks to the success of Pillars of Eternity, but one might also say that its initial sales numbers themselves might have suffered from launching before it. Lyrian was relatively unknown at the time compared to Obsidian, and it's likely many people were less excited about the title because of that. Additionally, previous Divinity games Larian had made were in real time, a design choice that was heavily influenced by their publishers and the lack of turn-based games in the marketplace. Turn-based games were few and far between during this time period, which may have also made players unaware that such games existed. During a talk at GDC in 2015, Sven Vinke revealed that Larian bet everything on the creation of Divinity Original Sin, risking bankruptcy but determined to follow through with his creative vision. Without a large publisher to cushion the investment, they had 1.5 million euros and ended up spending another 3 million to make the game due to the addition of voice acting, thousands of bug fixes, and ultimately their commitment to quality. The irony for those snobby publishers who rejected the project is that after the success of DOS 1, Divinity Original Sin 2 would go on to sell more than 7 million copies, outperforming Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2 by a huge margin, and moving more copies than all Larian's previous titles combined. But why is that? Let's discuss. Divinity Original Sin was created by a group of tabletop players, players who enjoy the creativity that games like Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder are known for. And because of this, DOS took a very hands-off approach to RPG gaming, allowing players the freedom to explore and tackle quests in the way that best suits their style of play. There are so many fantastic things about Divinity, but the variety of ways you can solve quests really showcases the genius of Larian Studios. Can't get through a locked door? Have you tried killing a party member and resurrecting them on the other side? This is the type of thing you can do in Divinity that simply had never been done successfully in a game before. In some ways, DOS shares a lot in common with Elden Ring in giving the player agency over the world, which I discussed in a video about the two games earlier this year. And this is because you are sort of dropped in and left to your own devices with minimal guidance on where to go and what to do, and you have maximum freedom on who to kill, which is virtually unheard of in gaming these days, unless you are playing a From Software title. Sven Vinke would say when talking to PC Gamer in October of 2017, It was so bloody hard to tell the story in the way that we're doing it, giving the player the freedom that they have and the ability to kill every single person that you encounter. It's a very hard game to make when you say, okay, here's a protagonist, oops, you killed him. We still have to tell the story. We had to make sure everything worked together where all the different permutations made sense to the player. That was very, very hard. But it's not just the freedom to explore and discover the world of Rivlon at your own pace that makes Divinity such a great game, it's also the insanely good combat that takes elemental interactions to the next level. Never before had a game successfully created a combat system revolving completely around environmental interactions and reactions that allows for a variety of different strategies depending on what elements you are focused on and what enemies you are facing. DOS's combat system alone is enough to make it an instant classic, but again, this is just one aspect of its brilliance. You throw in things like cooperative play, including local co-op, interesting and fun companions, and a subtle humor that permeates the game, and DOS is vaulted into a category of its own, and then DOS 2 took it to the next level. Divinity Original Sin 2 was also kickstarted for over $2 million in 2015, over doubling the first game, and promised to be bigger, better, and even more Divinity. And, at the same time, the Enhanced Edition of Divinity Original Sin 1 was releasing, which brought even more players to the franchise on console, keeping Divinity on players' minds while creating new fans. In short, Larian continued to crank out content for players all throughout the development of the second game, 
which went into early access in 2016. The sequel would spend two years in early access being polished and tweaked, and eventually Larian produced a sequel that was not only better than the first, but accomplished something few games to date had. Every single dialogue from every single NPC in DOS 2 was fully voiced, and fully voiced to the highest standards of gaming. This was a monumental feat for an isometric RPG that meant a delay in publishing, and even a complete redo of the already voiced lines, but it was so successful that it would prompt Josh Sawyer over at Obsidian to push for a fully voiced Pillars of Eternity 2 in order to compete. Sven would say in the same article talking to PC Gamer, It was very clear that people wanted us to voice everything despite a number of people writing on the community forums that they didn't care about voiceovers. We looked for opportunities to do so, but there was so much voicing to be done that initially it was not going to be possible had we stuck to the original release date. We actually redid the voices at one point. We started recording and eventually realized that the way we were doing it was not going to work. We were well into recording at this stage and knew that we didn't have too much time, but we knew we had to redo it. Divinity Original Sin 2 also had more skills, more elemental combinations, including the new Cursed and Blessed effects. Players could also respec more easily, allowing for a lot more freedom to try different builds, and status effects were changed to be tied to armor or a lack thereof instead of an RNG chance to trigger. And on top of all of that, DOS 2 featured 4-player cooperative and competitive play and ended up adding a dungeon master mode that let players create and run their own campaigns, further extending the playtime of the game. The key to the success of the sequel is that Larian didn't change the fundamental formula of the game, still allowing players to explore Rivalon with freedom in the playstyle of their choosing. Many of the design decisions we see in Baldur's Gate 3 are actually based on the same design choices of DOS 2, only wrapped inside a D&D container. Divinity Original Sin 2 has been such a success that Wizards of the Coast tipped Larian to produce Baldur's Gate 3 some 20 years after Baldur's Gate 2, which released earlier this year and is very likely to win Game of the Year. We discussed how fitting it was that Larian would be the one to revive the Baldur's Gate series in our 34 Years of D&D History video, so check that out if you want more details on how we got there. BG3 was developed in the same engine and players can see the similarities almost immediately when looking at the games, with the real difference being in the D&D ruleset and the cinematic dialogue interactions, interactions which will hopefully carry over to DOS 3. Larian also had another spin-off project in the works called Divinity Fallen Heroes that was supposed to be a mashup of XCOM and Divinity Original Sin but was later cancelled. A board game is also set to release late this year and early next year based on Divinity Original Sin 2, but the big news is, of course, Larian confirming that there will be a sequel to DOS 2 and that the franchise will continue. This is music to the ears of all Divinity fans, and one cannot help but wonder when we'll be hearing something about this project and if it's already in development. Will it be kickstarted like the two previous games? Does it even need to be at this point? What sort of changes will be made to the gameplay and what can we expect from it? Time will tell, and we'll of course keep you updated as soon as we hear anything. So that wraps up our video on why Divinity Original Sin 2 is one of the best games of all time. Have you guys played it yet if you've played Baldur's Gate 3? You really should if you haven't already. Stay tuned because I plan to do a comparison video of Baldur's Gate 3 and Divinity Original Sin 2 about the things I like and dislike of each of these games. I did one of these videos way earlier on before Baldur's Gate had actually released several years ago, but I want to do one now that I've gotten to play through the game for many, many hundreds of hours and really do a thorough comparison, so stay tuned for that.